In 1845, two ships carrying 134 men set sail from England in order to explore an unnavigated stretch of the Arctic waters between Canada and Greenland in search of the long-sought-after Northwest Passage. They vanished into the fog of history, never to be heard from again. Over the next 160 years, search parties uncovered tantalizing clues as to the fate of what is now known as the Lost Franklin Expedition, culminating in the 2014 and 2016 discoveries of the well-preserved wrecks of the HMS Erebus and HMS Terror. These clues tell a grisly story of futile hope, starvation, madness, and the macabre ends of 134 souls. You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore all things weird and bizarre in the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting's managing editor, John Karaski, and today I'm joined by staff writer Marco Margaritoff. Hello, John. Hello, Marco. Today we'll be talking about the Lost Franklin Expedition and some of the grim theories about what happened on that doomed voyage. So, Marco, why are you interested in this story? So, the reason I voted for this was because it's a really vivid tale of people in olden times just navigating the seas and uncovering things that hadn't been discovered yet. Um, and just reading about a crew of hundreds uh, risking their lives just to add to the world's maps of the time and find new trade routes is amazing. Um, I'm also really into horror, so the imagery of ships disappearing into the fog, never to be found again, is just hooks me instantly. Yeah. Classic, spooky, seafaring story. Exactly. What about you? What? Uh, why do you like this story, John? Well, I have one word for you. Yes? Cannibalism. Oh, right. So... They didn't prove any of this, and we'll get to it later, but mm. one of the many macabre things that may have happened out there on the ice was cannibalism. And when the researchers first found some of these bodies in 1984, it was? Yes. It was a little earlier than that, but yeah, that's when they um, oh, exhumed that's, them. And right. They first exhumed them in 84. And I just love the image of opening these coffins for the first time in what, 140 years and seeing these, you know, faces kind of frozen literally and figuratively in anguish. And then the researchers, uh, looking at the bones and finding that cannibalism may have also been in the mix. So, yeah, uh, there was, uh, yeah, sufficient evidence to support that theory. Um, but we'll get to that later. We will indeed. But first we should probably tell these people about the voyage. Yes. So they left England in 1845, huh? Yes, they left England in 1845. Um, it was May 19, I believe. Europe was fairly obsessed with finding a shortcut to Asia through the West at this point. That goal had been there since the days of Columbus, but the English in particular felt this was the right time to finally locate that shortcut. Um, many of these expeditions originated in England, including this one. Yeah, this was far from the first voyage that any of the European powers had commissioned in order to find the Northwest Passage. It would have been a very lucrative trade route, and it would have cemented a great claim to power in the New World, which wasn't so new at the time, uh, for whichever country found it. And by the mid-19th century... England was in many ways leading this charge, and they had sunk a lot of resources into doing it. However, even though they were ready and willing to spend a lot of money and a lot of lives in finding it, they had some kind of antiquated beliefs about what they were in for. And uh, Marco will tell you a little bit about that later on. But first, I will add that one of the great ironies here is that though... Many countries had tried for centuries to find the Northwest Passage. It was actually the McClure Arctic Expedition, the one that was sent to find the remains of the Franklin Expedition in 1850, that did locate the passage. Now, several other passages were located after that, and the first complete passage of it wasn't made until the early 20th century, 
but in 1850, the McClure expedition did find it. However, the crews of the terror and the Erebus were not so lucky either in finding it or staying alive. We know that it ended in death, but before they set out, Marco, how big was the risk here? It was still quite a risk, even though countless previous expeditions uh, ruled a lot of areas out. Um, but this is still the 1800s, and it's still just men on wooden ships, you know, setting sail for the Arctic, trying to find something that has never been discovered. Some of the most notable expeditions preceding this one were those spearheaded by Martin Frobisher in 1576 and John Davis in 1585. Um, they both described Baffin Island um, as a barren obstacle, basically, with passages to the west entirely blocked by ice. So a seemingly insurmountable challenge. Right, and soon after that, uh, the famous Henry Hudson went looking for it. And if I remember correctly, he went up the Hudson, but only got as far as Albany. And if people aren't familiar with New York geography, that's not super far up. Not very far, right. Nowhere near the Northwest Passage. <laughs> yeah, so while that's true, um, he did lead another expedition in 1611. Um, and he did get as far as Baffin Island, but his crew was so homesick that they mutinied when he tried to go further west. Um, legend has it that he tried to keep up with the ship after being tossed into a rowboat when the uh, crew took over the ship. So Baffin Island is the largest island in Canada and actually the fifth largest island in the world. And it's located at the northeastern part of the country in the icy waters between Canada's borders and Greenland. Right. So until the 1800s, people had made it that far, but never further west. Um, Second Secretary of England's Royal Navy's Admiralty, Sir John Barrow, started pushing to finally find this trade route once and for all in 1804. Um, he was adamant that that route over Canada into Asia was just waiting for the UK to discover, but he also thought seawater couldn't freeze, so he was had some pros and cons to his personality and education. But partly due to previous expeditions that he helped push, there were only about 70,000 square miles left to search by 1845. So it seemed like a fairly viable expedition, even though, again, these are hundreds of men on wooden ships heading into the Arctic in the 1800s. Nonetheless, Barrow assigned John Franklin to command the Erebus and Francis Crozier to command the Terror. The latter had commanded that ship before, in the Arctic specifically, so he was pretty familiar with it. And um, the ships were also pretty well supplied. Right. So there were 134 men and about three years worth of supplies. That meant a lot of food. So more than 32,000 pounds of preserved meat, 930 gallons of lemon juice, presumably to stave off scurvy, 580 gallons of pickles, Altogether, there were 8,000 tins of food, and perhaps the most interesting among them uh, <laughs> was the more than 1,000 pounds of raisins, which, if our very official calculations are correct, would be something in the neighborhood of 1.7 million raisins. Right. Um, <laughs> so they also had a library of 2,000 books, so that's two books to every uh, one pound of raisins, which is an incredible ratio. Right. That's the golden ratio. Equally incredible is the fact that in order to gather all of these supplies, uh, they only had about seven weeks to do it. And when you consider how much they had to gather, that is not much time at all. And while this might seem like a small fact now, it's going to... <laughs> come back and bite them later on. Yeah, we'll get to that later. Um, but that already alludes to one of the more interesting theories uh, regarding what happened to these 134 men. But yes, yeah, so the ships left Greenhithe Harbor just on the outskirts of London on the morning of May 19th, 1845. 
They then made one brief stop at Stromness Harbour in Scotland's Orkney Islands, and then took one last break in Greenland's amazingly named Disco Bay. Um, that's where they slaughtered 10 oxen and divided that meat up for both ships and had a chance to write their very last letters home. Um, this was also the last chance for anyone to change their mind because after this there would be no more stops. Um, five men were discharged here and sent home. Why is pretty unclear, though we do know that the two rules on Franklin's expedition were no cursing and no drunkenness. Right, so these guys that were sent home were drunk. Yes, that's what I'm... I, I can picture that vividly. Yeah, and this was the last time that they were seen again or not? Uh, you'd think so, but actually no, because um, both ships were seen... Um, near passing Baffin Bay by um, a whaler aptly named Prince of Wales and um, another ship called the Enterprise. Um, Captain Dannett and Captain Martin of the Prince of Wales and Enterprise respectively saw the two Franklin ships pass by and um, give an all okay sign. And um, that was actually the last time anyone saw the ships above water or any of the crew alive. Right, and that was July 1845, so they were some two months into their journey, and it was at this point that they did, as you said, Marco, vanish into the fog of history. In Baffin's Bay, where the willfish blow, is the fate of Franklin, no one knows. Ten thousand pounds I would freely give. To learn that my husband still So after the ships failed to return to England for over two years, people started worrying. Uh, Lady Franklin in particular was upset, and she pushed successfully for a search party expedition in 1848. By 1850, that search involved both Brits and Americans they found the first signs uh, that something had gone terribly wrong when they met on Beachy Island, Canada. That island is northwest of Baffin Island. So it was clear that the expedition had gone farther than anyone had before. Right. And that's where in 1850, they found three graves dating to 1846. They also found a stone hut and some cans of food. So it's clear that the survivors of the expedition had kind of set up shop there and lived some of their last presumably terrifying days, and we'll get to that later, on Beachy Island. Four years later, uh, an explorer named John Ray found some relics there and even heard tales from some of the local Inuit population that some very desperate sailors had indeed been in the area several years back. Five years after that, another search by Francis McClintock found a letter that gave researchers more insight than ever into the fate of the Franklin expedition. Right. That note uh, has since been called the victory point note um, because of the specific location on that island it was found. It fills in some of the gaps of this mystery. The note was written on a standard admiralty form, uh, which had the same message in several languages. It's sort of an emergency uh, document, as far as I understand. So in addition to those typed up instructions to deliver this note to people in charge, there were two handwritten messages which confirmed the following. The first message was written in May 1847, and that message confirmed that Franklin was in charge of the expedition and there were no casualties report and nothing else major, really. The second uh, message was written nearly a year later in April 1848. Um, this message explained that 24 sailors had already died, including Franklin, and it also confirmed that both ships had been deserted after being trapped in the ice for an excruciating 19 months. 
So that is known for sure. The stunning thing here is that it wasn't until the 1980s, which is over 120 years after McClintock's expedition, that any of the bodies were exhumed, even though graves had been discovered, you know, over 100 years before that. Um, it was Owen Beatty of the University of Alberta that finally took bone samples and tissue samples in 1981. And he found for the very first time in this whole mysterious story that um, much of the crew, at least the bodies that he analyzed, um, had heavy signs of vitamin C deficiencies and scurvy, and most ominously were potential victims of cannibalism. Some of the bones had clear knife marks and cuts that uh, indicated that these people were you know, dismembered or at least wounded by someone else. The bodies also showed high traces of lead poisoning, which brings us back to the poor quality control in the food production for this expedition. A year later, Beattie retraced McClintock's steps and found even more remains. Um, these were of between 6 to 14 people which I'm still a bit confused as to how that is unclear if we have DNA testing at this point. It seems to me like they could distinguish how many people those remains belong to specifically, but I guess I don't know much about DNA testing. Finally, in 1984, BD was able to get permission to perform autopsies on three of the bodies on Beachy Island. These were the remains of William Brain, John Hartnell, and most infamously, John Torrington. Uh, Torrington was a 20-year-old who perished sometime after they got there when we don't know for sure. But what we do know is that when the coffin was opened, his face was startlingly well-preserved after 140 some years, uh, due to the cold temperatures, but researchers were not at all ready for what they were about to see. His eyes were open wide, seemingly in horror, still as blue as they were when he was alive albeit a bit milky from more than a century beneath the ice. And by the way, you can see this face if you wish on all that's interesting.com. Yeah, it's worth a visit for sure. Those photos are incredible. Um, they show Torrington dressed in clothes from back then. It was a gray cotton shirt with buttons made of shell. He was wearing linen pants and yeah, he was actually properly buried. He was buried on a bed of wood chips there was fabric covering his face. Um, strangely, his limbs were tied together with strips of linen. Why is unclear, but again, those photos are worth a, a visit. And in order to get him out of the ice and take those photos, first they had to safely exhume the body, and that was quite an ordeal. Uh, in fact, one of the things that the team had to do was pour warm water on the ice to help break through it and finally get the coffin up, at which point they were able to collect bone and tissue samples. And uh, again, they found high levels of lead in his body, uh, as well as the body of John Hartnell. Um, when Beatty wrote his report on, uh, on these findings, he said that Torrington, quote, would have suffered severe mental and physical problems caused by lead poisoning. Right. Meanwhile, his body itself showed no signs of physical trauma. There were no wounds or any scars. Um, according to the exhumation report, however, his brain was at this point, which again is, you know, over a century later, merely a, quote, yellow granular liquid. Um, he was stunningly malnourished and weighed no more than 88 pounds. Um, and the report also showed signs of pneumonia, severe exposure to the elements and starvation clearly and yeah these bodies this analysis in the 80s was the first close-up look at any of the crew members and they you know indicated just how horrible the conditions of the franklin crew had been before they finally died Right. What these findings left us with was a portrait of struggle, starvation, terror, perhaps cannibalism, 
out there on the ice, but what happened for sure, we don't know. So clearly nobody lived to tell about it, but researchers generally agree on the following series of events. By October, the Erebus and the Terror found themselves irreparably icebound. Days turned to months, months turned to nearly two years. So the crews had been stranded for 19 entire months, trapped, freezing, and starving. On top of that, they were suffering from lead poisoning while entombed in those two Arctic ships. So it was only a matter of time before the crew would resort to cannibalism. Right. Despite all those reasons that they brought, they were trapped. These ships were outfitted as Arctic exploration vessels, even though they had formerly been warships. Uh, What that meant is that iron plating was added to their hulls and cross plank decks were also added to distribute impact forces with ice. But nevertheless, the Erebus and the Terror just could not forge ahead through the Arctic ice once they reached the area of Beachy Island. So the crews eventually had no choice but to abandon the ships and try their best to find some kind of salvation on land. In fact, some desperate sailors tried their best to trek overland to Fort Resolution, a Hudson's Bay Company outpost 600 miles to the southwest. And so naturally, every single person died of either exposure, starvation, or both. Um, And with the 1980s exhumation showing lead poisoning, um, it's possible that some of these people died of lead poisoning before the elements or lack of food got to them. And what would account for this lead poisoning? So the people responsible for the Franklin Expedition's supplies uh, purportedly only had seven weeks to prepare. Um, So that means poor quality control, you know, rushed assembling three years worth of food supplies in under two months in the 1800s that might not have been as easy as it is today. Um, So yeah, probably the tinning and canning of food. That's the most rational theory about that. And without enough food, once they became stranded, yes, cannibalism. Well, likely cannibalism. Beatty and his crew found knife marks on some of the bones that suggest the kind of cutting that would be consistent with the bodies being chopped up to be eaten. And in addition to that, uh, oral reports from the local Inuit population said that the sailors there had resorted to cannibalism. Perhaps most convincing is a study from as recently as 2015 in which some scientists looked at the bones and they concluded that the bones had been cracked and heated in a way that would definitely be consistent with cannibalism. That is... The starving sailors would have taken the bones of their fallen crew members and then cracked them open and heated them up in order to extract the marrow from inside. So clearly, the men of the Franklin expedition became desperate. They were stranded. They had no further recourse. And while some of their remains had been found at this point, the two lost ships, the Erebus and the Terror, were still entirely undiscovered and nowhere to be found. April 25, 1848. HM ships Terror and Erebus were deserted on 22nd April, five leagues north-northwest of this having been beset since 12th of September, 1846. The officers and crews, consisting of 105 souls, under the command of Captain F.R.M. Crozier, landed here. Sir John Franklin died on the 11 June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and 15 men. Start on tomorrow for Baxfish River. James Fitzjames, Captain, HMS Erebus. F.R.M. Crozier, Captain and Senior Officer. Renewed efforts to find the terror and the Erebus started in 2008 when the Canadian government announced a massive search project. Canada believed that if they could find these ships, it would strengthen the country's claim of sovereignty over the Northwest Passage and big chunks of the Arctic. The US and Canada have long been embroiled in a battle over whether or not these valuable shipping and resource mining areas are Canadian territories or international ones. 
Canada had been hoping that finding these ships would help strengthen their claims to this turf. Though the ships are British, Canada and its former colonial overlords made a deal in 1997 that ownership of the wrecks, if found, would ultimately be transferred to Canada. And if ownership of the wrecks was to be Canadian, then Canada could argue that the areas where the wrecks were found were Canadian too. However, the vanished ships remained missing across numerous search expeditions. In 2008, 2010, 2011, and 2012, nobody found a single thing. At last, in 2014, Canada discovered the sunken Erebus at the bottom of the eastern portion of Queen Maud Gulf, west of O'Reilly Island. The team used sonar technology to detect the shape of the object and matched it to the Erebus's design, confirming once and for all they'd found the long-lost ship. Two years later, a team from the Arctic Research Foundation located the Terror off the southern coast of King William Island. Thanks to the remotely operated underwater drones sent inside through openings like the main hatchway and crew cabin skylights, footage of the interior was captured for the first time in history. While the mystery of these historic ships' whereabouts can finally be laid to rest, the international battle for Arctic territory has only become more complicated in recent years, as world powers like Russia, Canada, and the U.S. all fight for the region's resources. Scientists have already estimated that the Arctic Ocean will be ice-free during the summer as early as 2040, which would allow shipping vessels to pass through. As of now, two new shipping routes are already under development. These shortcuts could reduce the distance between Europe and Asia by 40%, and with 90% of world trade done on the water, there's a lot of money and power at stake, and thus a lot more battling on the horizon. For the brave souls who gave their lives traversing the ocean aboard the Terror and Erebus now nearly 200 years ago, these geopolitical battles may not seem new. After all, they were looking for the Northwest Passage that's still in dispute today. But as this international battle for the Arctic plays itself out, perhaps the Terror will take on more importance than ever thought possible, and perhaps its crew will have perished for something far greater than they ever could have imagined when stranded on the ice all the way back in 1845. Across the centuries of seafaring, both before and after the Lost Franklin expedition, the annals of history are dotted with tales as gripping as those of the Erebus and the Terror. From the sloop found under the World Trade Center to the Russian cargo vessel carrying $130 billion in gold, these are some of the most fascinating shipwreck stories in history. On June 4, 1629, the Dutch East India Company flagship, the Batavia, wrecked nearly 40 miles off Australia's coast on Morning Reef near Beacon Island. Destined for the colonies of modern-day Jakarta, the ship never made it. Treacherous storms caused it to separate from the rest of the fleet, before leaving hundreds of sailors on the desolate Houtman Abraholhos Islands. Commander Francisco Pelsaert and skipper Arian Jacobs had come into this voyage distrusting each other, and the animosity between them would only grow. Before the wreck, Deputy Geronimus Cornelis had conspired with Jacobs to mutiny against Pilsaert. Once shipwrecked, Pilsaert decided to take the ship's longboat and risk his life to travel thousands of miles to Batavia and modern-day Indonesia to find help. Now known as Trader's Island, the remaining survivors camped on Beacon Island. Cornelis used Pelsaert's absence to form his own kingdom. With no fresh water or food, everyone relied on the new dictator and his loyal men. Unfortunately, he confiscated all remaining rations, weapons, and rafts before beginning to slaughter the survivors. Pelsaert miraculously arrived at Batavia 33 days later and arranged to have Jakobs arrested for negligence only realizing it was Cornelis who was the real threat upon arriving back at the camp 63 days after that. Pilsaert returned to find an estimated 125 men, women, and children murdered. 
The women were raped beforehand, and the dead were either drowned in the ocean or had their throats cut at night. As punishment, Cornelis had his hands cut off before being hanged for his crimes. The shipwreck, meanwhile, was discovered in 1963. It helped establish many of Australia's heritage laws governing archaeological sites and is now on display at the Western Australian Museum in Fremantle. The Patriot disappeared at sea on January 2nd, 1813, taking all of its passengers along with it, including the daughter of 3rd Vice President Aaron Burr, Theodosia Burr Alston. The ship left Charleston, North Carolina in December 1812 with Theodosia aboard, eager to arrive in New York City to visit her father before his trial for killing Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Unfortunately, a storm blew in days after the ship set sail, vanquishing the schooner and its passengers for good. Some believed the ship had been captured by pirates, while others spread rumors Theodosia had survived. The discovery of a painting known as the Nags Portrait in 1869 only renewed interest in the theory. It's believed that Theodosia was ferrying a painting across the ocean as a gift for her father. A painting depicting someone strikingly similar to Theodosia was subsequently found in the North Carolina home of a family well known for looting ships. The owner claimed this portrait was found in an abandoned boat that drifted ashore at Nags Head on the Outer Banks. In the end, neither Theodosia nor the Patriot itself were ever found. Nobody could have guessed that work at Ground Zero in New York City would yield the discovery of a 200-year-old ship, but that's exactly what cleanup efforts unearthed. Experts from the Tree Ring Research Lab at the Le Monde Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University traced the ship's hull back to colonial-era Philadelphia. Researchers believe the ship was a Hudson River sloop designed by the Dutch to carry passengers and cargo from one side of the river to the other. It was put to good use, too, for 20 to 30 years before accidentally sinking into the Hudson. Perhaps most fascinating was the discovery that the trees it was cut from were felled in 1773, just a few years shy of the country's fight for independence. Even more historic, subsequent study found the ship was built from the same wood used to build Philadelphia's Independence Hall, where the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. Today, the vessel's remnants are stored at Texas A&M University. The Black Sea Maritime Archaeology Project spent three years surveying the floor of the Black Sea to analyze prehistoric sea level changes, but found what may be the oldest intact shipwreck in the world instead. The 75-foot ship remained untouched at 1.2 miles below the surface for over 2,400 years. Fortunately, the oxygen-free water in the Black Sea's depths kept air from wearing it out and kept animals and divers away. For Professor John Adams, who served as principal investigator on the project, the 2018 find was unprecedented. He said, quote, this will change our understanding of shipbuilding and seafaring in the ancient world. Adams and his team posit this was an ancient Greek vessel used for trading purposes. Until 2018, this kind of ship was only seen in, quote, the side of ancient Greek pottery, such as the Siren Vase in the British Museum. This artifact dates to 480 BC and depicts Homer's hero Odysseus tied to a ship's mast to resist the deadly call of the siren song. Experts removed a small piece of the ship to carbon date it, but have left the vessel itself in its final resting place, where it remains undisturbed by animals, oxygen, and people to this day. On December 5, 1872, the abandoned Mary Celeste was found drifting through the Atlantic by the British brig De Gratia. Found near the Azores Islands a thousand miles west of Portugal, it appeared pristine with even the crew's clothes neatly packed away, but without a single soul in sight. Only a missing lifeboat and disassembled pump remained as clues. The ghost ship had left New York Harbor for Genoa, Italy a month earlier. The crew of seven, along with Captain Briggs and his family, however, 
were never seen again. The last log entry two weeks after setting sail showed no signs of trouble. Though the bilge was flooded in four feet of water, the cargo was fully intact, save for a few barrels of denatured alcohol missing its contents. Some theorized alcohol-induced mutiny was to blame. Others believed it had been captured by a former slave. Mysteriously, no signs of violence nor commandeering were ever found. Even the three-month investigation by the de Gratia to enter a salvage claim in Admiralty Court resulted in more questions than answers. Only documentarian Anne McGregor's 2002 efforts to reconstruct the ship's drift came close to solving the puzzle. Her research showed the captain's faulty chronometer was to blame, leaving the crew 120 miles off course. She believes the crew was forced to abandon ship when bad weather made it begin to take on water. Nonetheless, only theories persist, with the truth just as mysterious as the crew's final resting place. Finding a Russian warship thousands of feet below sea level is remarkable enough, but discovering its contents are 200 tons of gold worth an estimated $130 billion is another matter entirely. That is what an international team of experts found off the coast of a South Korean island in July 2018, the Dmitry Donskoy, untouched and waiting. The vessel sunk in 1905 during the Battle of Tsushima, the final defeat of the Russian Navy in the Russo-Japanese War. It's believed the captain scuttled the warship after being fatally hit so that the Japanese wouldn't get their hands on its valuable cargo. 113 years later, with the help of South Korean maritime salvage company, Shimil Group, and its submersible vehicles, experts finally captured footage of the vessel. The visuals, available on our site, showed the ship's cannons, deck guns, anchor, and ship's wheel encrusted in 113 years of marine growth. Designed as a commerce raider, it was mainly used in the Mediterranean Sea and in the Far East. When war broke out, its purpose was to protect transport ships. The day it sank saw 60 of the total 591 crew members killed and 120 injured. Captain anchored it, ordering his men to abandon before scuttling it the following morning. Though Chenille Group said it planned to give Russia half of any recovered gold, the group withdrew its salvage claim shortly after entering it. South Korean police found several members guilty of fraud, including the vice chairman was sentenced to five years in prison. The Donskoy, meanwhile, remains lurking in the ocean. This Spanish galleon mysteriously blew up and sank during battle with four British ships in 1708 while carrying untold amounts of gold from Spain's colonies in South America. The treasure, intended to fund war efforts against the English, remains missing to this day. The San Jose sinking saw 600 lives lost. While it remains a mystery why the ship exploded, its gold, silver, and emerald contents are entirely undisputed. Only the salvage rights continue to cause an international battle between governments. The shipwreck was found off the coast of Colombia in December 2015. The Colombian and Spanish governments, as well as a private company, have claimed to hold legal right over the remnants and treasure still lingering in the Atlantic. Colombia has since classified any information regarding the San Jose's location as a state secret, with the country's Ministry of Culture officially in charge of overseeing handling of the wreckage. As for the treasure, the Office of Inspector General requested thorough records of all discoveries be taken, and the sum of all coins and gemstones be given to Colombia's central bank. Thanks for listening to this episode of History Uncovered. To learn more about the HMS Terror and see the photos of all that was uncovered by researchers, please visit our website at allthatsinteresting.com. We'll leave you with a quote from Lady Franklin's Lament. In Baffin's Bay, where the whalefish blow, the fate of Franklin no man may know. Thanks for listening to History Uncovered. 
I'm History Uncovered's producer, Kit Westneat. If you like the show, help others find us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to follow the All That's Interesting and History Revealed pages on Facebook and Real History Uncovered on Instagram. Make sure you don't miss out on the new episodes and subscribe to the History Uncovered podcast. And keep up with our latest stories at allthatsinteresting.com. If you have a question about the show or just want to say hi, feel free to call us at 929-526-3029 or email us at podcast at allthatsinteresting.com. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like Legends of the Old West and Redacted History. Until next time, keep exploring.